Way back near the beginning of this series, I introduced vectors. We have since learned how to add vectors, multiply them by scalars, and to add them to several other kinds of objects, but there is one operation that I keep mentioning that we haven't covered yet. Multiplication of vectors. In this video, we will finally learn how to multiply two vectors. This video is a part of From Zero to Geo, a series where we- Wait, I don't want to show this animation here. It will spoil the video. Uh, this video is a part of From Zero to Geo, a series where we formulate geometric algebra, an incredibly powerful branch of mathematics from the ground up. Before we get started, I want to point out that this is a problem that many people have solved in different ways. Depending on your background, you might be familiar with the dot product, the cross product, the tensor product, or the exterior product. However, none of these are what we are looking for. Each of these operations has several issues. For example, the dot and cross products are not associative, and the tensor and exterior products are usually not invertible. We want to come up with a product of vectors that is as similar to normal multiplication as possible. To be explicit, we want to satisfy as many of these conditions as we can. Before we start looking at multiplication of vectors, try to figure it out for yourself first. Like I said before, there are many different ways to solve this problem, so you may not come up with the same answer as I will, but I think it would be good to explore this idea for yourself first. Before you pause the video, I want to mention that it's actually impossible to come up with a definition of multiplication that satisfies all of these conditions in all dimensions. There does exist a well-behaved solution in two dimensions, but in higher dimensions, you must drop a condition. So if you come up with a way to multiply vectors, see if and how you can generalize it to higher dimensions. Anyway, please pause the video and try to solve this before continuing. Given how complicated things can get in higher dimensions, let's start simple. For now, let's only consider one dimension. In one dimension, our first idea might be to just think of one-dimensional vectors as numbers and borrow multiplication from them. It's what we did for the addition of vectors, so it'll work for multiplication too, right? The problem with this is that it singles out one side as positive and one side as negative. When doing geometry, we want all directions to be equivalent by default, and using the multiplication of numbers to multiply vectors makes each direction act differently. In particular, the product of two vectors pointing to the right points to the right, and the product of two vectors pointing to the left points to the right as well. This singles out the right as the positive direction when we don't want either direction to be any more special than the other. Thus, this process won't work. Playing around in one dimension for a while, it might seem impossible to come up with a good definition of the multiplication of vectors that produces another vector. And that's because it is impossible. Since something squared is equal to its negative squared, we will always have this problem of singling out a particular direction if the product of two vectors produces a vector. But who says that the product of two vectors should produce a vector? Instead, we can have the product of two vectors be some other object, like a scalar. We can already turn a vector into a scalar by finding its length, so we could just multiply the length of two vectors and say that this is how we multiply vectors. The issue here is that we lose associativity. Consider these three vectors. When multiplying three vectors, we will first multiply two of the vectors to produce a scalar, and since we already know how to multiply scalars and vectors, we can multiply the resulting scalar with the third vector by scaling it. So we see that if we multiply u and v first, we get a vector in the direction of w. However, if we multiply v and w first, we get a vector in the direction of u. Thus, this definition of the product of two vectors is not associative. Associativity is one of the most important algebraic properties a product can have, so this definition won't work either. Notice though that in this case, the two results only differ by a minus sign. Maybe we can throw in a minus sign somewhere to cancel that one. Looking at the two different products, on one side, the two vectors we were multiplying first faced in the same direction, while on the other side the two vectors we were multiplying first faced in opposite directions. Could we just say that the product of two vectors facing in opposite directions is the negative of the product of their lengths? This does fix this issue with associativity here. In fact, it turns out to always be associative. This definition, where the product of two vectors facing in the same direction is the product of their lengths, and the product of two vectors facing in opposite directions is the negative of the product of their lengths, is what we will use going forward for the product of one-dimensional vectors.
Of course, only being able to multiply one-dimensional vectors isn't nearly enough. How do we multiply arbitrary vectors? Let's consider two dimensions now. Since the product of two one-dimensional vectors is a scalar, you might try to find a way to extend that to a product that takes in two two-dimensional vectors and produces a scalar. However, any such product loses associativity again. Consider these three vectors. If we multiply u and v first, the entire product will be some scaled version of w, and if we multiply v and w first, the entire product will be some scaled version of u. We can't throw in a minus sign to fix this this time, since the vectors are now linearly independent. I guess technically, if we define the product to be zero for all vectors it would work, but that's just silly. So, if we want a good product in two dimensions, it can't always produce a scalar. We do still know how to multiply parallel vectors, and that produces a scalar, but for other vectors we can't produce just a scalar. Since we know how to multiply parallel vectors, let's focus on the opposite of parallel vectors, perpendicular vectors. What should the product of two perpendicular vectors be? We've already seen from earlier arguments that producing a scalar or a vector are both out. The next object we could make is a bivector. Looking at these two perpendicular vectors, there is a pretty natural bivector we can draw. Furthermore, the magnitude of this bivector does happen to be the product of the magnitudes of the vectors, so this bivector does seem to be like some sort of product of the two vectors. Let's make this official. The product of two perpendicular vectors is the bivector that the two vectors make. Actually, which of the bivectors that the two vectors make? We can have two different orientations. So which do we pick? When finding a product uv, let's say that the resulting bivector is the bivector that goes along u first and then along v. So the product of two perpendicular vectors is the bivector that goes along the first vector and then along the second. Now, while we are now able to multiply perpendicular vectors, we still can't multiply arbitrary vectors yet. We can only multiply purely parallel and purely perpendicular vectors. However, there's a nice trick you can use to multiply arbitrary vectors from just knowing how to multiply parallel and perpendicular vectors. Consider two arbitrary vectors. While they are not parallel or perpendicular, we can write v as the sum of two parts, one which is parallel to u and the other which is perpendicular to u. Now we can distribute, and the two terms we have remaining are the product of parallel and perpendicular vectors, which we already know how to find. Thus, the product of u and v is the sum of this scalar and bivector. Let's summarize what we have learned. We can multiply two parallel vectors by multiplying their lengths, with a minus sign thrown in if the vectors are pointing in opposite directions. This idea of common directions becoming a scalar is often called contraction. We can multiply two perpendicular vectors by finding the bivector that the two vectors make, with the orientation that goes along the first vector in the product and then the second. This idea of distinct directions producing a bigger object is often called joining. Then, to multiply two arbitrary vectors, we can split one vector into a parallel part and a perpendicular part, distribute, and then use the rules for the product of parallel and perpendicular vectors. This definition of multiplication is called the geometric product, and it is the fundamental operation in geometric algebra. We will become very acquainted with it throughout the next several videos, and the rest of the series. But how do we actually calculate this product? It's nice to have a geometric picture, but actually calculating the geometric product seems quite difficult. Let's look at several simple examples to figure out how to do this. Consider the product of a vector with itself. A vector is parallel with itself, and points in the same direction as itself, so a vector squared is just its length squared. This seemingly simple identity is surprisingly important. In fact, in some senses, this equation right here is the fundamental property of geometric algebra. Now consider a basis vector squared. We defined our basis vectors to have a length of 1, so a basis vector squared is 1 squared, or just 1. Now let's consider the product of two different basis vectors, such as e1 and e2. We defined these two basis vectors to be perpendicular, so their product is this bivector. What about the product e2, e1? You may think it's equal to e1, e2 by commutativity, but that's actually not the case. Notice that e2, e1 goes along e2 first and then along e1, so its orientation is opposite that of e1, e2. 
This means that E1, E2 is equal to minus E2, E1. Thus, the geometric product is not commutative. This formula generalizes to all distinct basis vectors. Note that it is important that i is not equal to j here. If this formula was valid when i equals j, we would have e1, e1 equals negative e1, e1, which implies that 1 equals negative 1, which is preposterous. It turns out that by using just these two rules, we can calculate any geometric product. Let's look at an example. We can first distribute fully, and we end up getting four different terms. e1 squared and e2 squared are equal to 1, which simplifies the expression a bit. Then, we can swap e2 and e1 here at the cost of a minus sign. We can then factor out e1, e2, producing this result. This is generally how you calculate the geometric product. You distribute, you simplify the square of any basis vector, and you swap whatever basis vectors you need to to make terms line up adding minus signs in the process. As I said before, the geometric product is the fundamental operation in geometric algebra. Because of this, you should get very acquainted with calculating products. So let's do an exercise. Please calculate all of these products. You can use the example we just went through as a reference. Because these are computational problems, I won't work through the answers and just show the solutions in a few seconds. Now I want to bring up something you may have noticed. We defined the product of E1 and E2 to be the bivector going along E1 and then along E2. This is precisely the bivector E12 that we defined in the last chapter. Thus, E1 times E2 is equal to E12. This generalizes to all products of different basis vectors where EI times EJ is equal to EIJ. Also, Remember that previously, when working in two dimensions, we called e12 i. We have seen in this video that the product of two vectors is a scalar plus a bivector, so in two dimensions, the product of two vectors has the form a plus bi. The final thing I want to talk about in this video is how we formally define the geometric product. Some people, when first encountering geometric algebra, get confused as to how the geometric product is formally defined and how to calculate it. I hope I've shown here how to calculate the geometric product in detail, but how do we define the geometric product formally? This question is much more difficult than it may seem. The first definition of the geometric product I gave in this video relies too much on geometry to be that rigorous. For those of you that know a little more linear algebra, we could instead define the geometric product using these equations on an orthonormal basis and then extending by linearity. This produces the same result. However, it's important not to drop the geometric picture of what is going on. This idea of parallel directions contracting and perpendicular directions joining is fundamental to how we will use the product and how we will generalize it to all multivectors. So even if you want to use a formal definition, please don't forget about the geometry of the product. I would say that geometric algebra is the kind of topic that makes more sense informally than formally. That's not to say that formal definitions don't exist or aren't useful. In fact, a lot of my own work has been in formalizing geometric algebra. I just think that it's important to remember the bigger picture. So, we finally know how to multiply vectors. But vectors aren't the only thing we can work with. What about multiplying arbitrary multivectors? That is what we will look at in the next video.